welcome to Base Case 012 Practice. I'm your host, Phil. We'll be talking about practicing. Practice makes perfect, they say. Only, and then I heard someone say one time, perfect practice makes perfect. You've been practicing. I need to practice. This needs to be worked out, i.e. practiced. How much are you practicing? How do you get to Carnegie Hall? You practice. They, I mean, the word practice is embedded in the world of musicians, as it should be. So we hear that word all the time, and we hear in instructors and professors and musicians talking about practicing using that word, but the actual concept of practice is nebulous. You know, for instance, the use of the words practice and rehearsal. I hear people talking about, well, they're going to practice with their band tonight. I go, no, you're going to rehearse with your band. Practice is individualized. It's the stuff you do to get ready for the rehearsal. You're not supposed to be practicing at the rehearsal if that's what they're doing. It's so that you practice on your own so that you can integrate your parts into the other parts and everything's ready to go and the rehearsal goes a lot easier and it doesn't, has anything to do whether you're working with another person or an ensemble or a recording engineer for a recording session. You should practice. I'm kind of digressing a little bit, but it's something that like a friend of mine says, I'm always trying to control language, you know, and, it, and the idea of practicing to me is a big thing, and it's separate from rehearsal. Uh, Zen practicing. You know, last year I spent six months taking a weekly yoga course with a very committed yoga teacher who had studied yoga and Zen extensively and still does. And After class one day, he asked, he goes, hey, what are you going to do today? It was during the summer, and I told him, practice. And he raised his eyebrows, and he said, good. And later I started reading about Zen and the word practice to Zen and yoga practitioners is sitting and closing your eyes and deep breathing. And he was, so I had to explain to him the next time that practicing for me meant taking out one of my bases and working things out, you know. But there's a lot to centering the mind to practice, just like there is for athletic events or anything else that you're going to do that requires deep thinking and time and lots of focus, you need to set it in mind. I'm going to save that for another podcast. But back to practicing. You know, there's negative connotations about it. You know, people feel, I don't want to practice. You know, I don't want to practice my skills. My daughter plays piano. She doesn't want to practice sometimes. And, you know, she has to practice after dinner every day. And she's gotten into the groove of it. Uh, Kenny Warner, the jazz pianist who's written a couple books on actual practicing and dealing with being a musician, you know, just the just the cerebral and psychological part of what it takes to be a musician and how it's not all about practicing. He said something in one of his books about the sheer amount of stuff that needs to be practiced paralyzes us as musicians. I remember that in grad school. You, you keep putting it off because there's so much to practice that you get nothing done, you know. That's the, that's the negative part of it. Whit Marsalis, the jazz trumpeter, he calls practicing slaying the dragon. He created a video on it, you know, thinking about it, you know, that's negative. You know, I, I got to go kill the dragon, you know, but, you know, at the very least wounded, right? You know, but I like the analogy, but in the end it makes it feel like we're daunting and difficult when practicing should be somewhat enjoyable and we should be motivated to practice, not overwhelmed by it. You know, when I'm practicing, I'm working on something to get me closer to my goal. You know, like Mark Twain said, the secret to getting ahead is to uh, take a, take all the overwhelming things ahead of you and break them into small pieces and start on that very first one. That one made a lot of sense to me. Mark Twain's a real smart guy. So I think about the sheer amount of stuff that I have to practice. You know, I've got electric bass pieces and the technicals, you know, the... the uh, scales that come with it. I've got my double bass pieces and technicals, and that's both classical and jazz. And I've got my jazz pieces. They're broken down on my upright bass between pizzicato pieces and my arco pieces. And it's just a lot of stuff when I look at it. And it doesn't even mention the tunes that I'm teaching, the combo class that I really need to kind of keep warm and fresh. And, and the bass parts in my jazz ensemble, you know, so that I can hear and know that they're right. You know, how do I fit all of this stuff in? You know, I have a slate of solo pieces that I'm working on. And I've got to work these out, and I've got to make progress on them and get things done and move forward so I don't get caught in the morass of being overwhelmed. Or worse, something that happens, getting caught in a rabbit hole. 
You know, I've seen that happen. I've had it happen to myself. I'll be checking out uh, half whole diminished scale licks, and suddenly I'm involved in multiple articles and licks and ways I can put it in there when I just need to work one out, work the scale out, work the lick out. I just got back from a week off, really nine days when you count weekends of spring break. And whenever I have a break like that, you know, during Christmas break or my summer break or spring break, I really batten down the hatches and start thinking about what am I going to practice, you know, what am I going to work on? And I start listing it. What do I need to work on, you know? And I want to put forth the idea is that in that nine days, I want to get results. You know, weight trainers and personal trainers, they're real big on that. If you ever watch one of these uh, weight trainers or personal trainers in their videos, you talk to somebody that lifts weights or a bodybuilder or somebody that's in the personal training, or, they're always talking about results. They say, are you getting the results that you want? You know, are you getting stronger? Are you getting the body shape that you want? And it's the same way for us as musicians, you know, and that we have to understand something, though, that one size doesn't fit all in practicing. We have to get our results differently. Yes, you likely need to practice every day. But do you have to practice everything every day? I say no. So when I was setting up for b spring break, I looked at the list of pieces and texts that I had on my list, and I broke them down into the categories and I say, what is the most important thing I need to do? And how do I justify important? How I justify important and what I think I tell my students most of the time is your weaknesses. What is the stuff? What is the chart? What is the melody? What is the lick? What is the walking line? What are the changes? What is the tempo that you're struggling with? And you've got to zero in on that. You've got to kind of put away or put to the bottom of the list the stuff that you play well, you know, the stuff that makes you feel good. And you've got to get to the point of dealing with the stuff that makes you feel bad. That's the stuff that you don't sound so good on. And, you know, I've got that nine days, so I put them in the order. You know, I went to the top of the list, and there was three ARCO pieces, and I said, I'm going to work these out every day. You know, I know I'm already. I'm just going to hone these. And then I looked at the electric bass stuff, and I thought, I only have nine days. I'm just going to work out this one tune. I'm working out Jingles by Wes Montgomery. And it needs some work, and I still haven't got the, what I wanted to do at that tempo the way that I like it. So that one for that nine days was played extensively. I listened to Wes Montgomery played in a couple different recordings. I played it. I slowed it down. That, and I'm going to talk about that in a, in a subsequent podcast about slowing down while you're practicing. I was talking to a couple of my bass students yesterday about slowing everything down. James Moody said it. You know, He says, a wise man practices slowly. A wiser man practices more slowly. And there's no more truth than that. You save time by practicing slowly. So I got the practicing in, I logged all of it, and at the end of the nine days, yes, I got the results I wanted. I didn't get all the results I wanted, but I was a better player on those pieces, and that's the idea. I prioritized the stuff that was giving me trouble and worked on that. And you've got to do that with that way. I don't think there's any other way. I don't think that playing the stuff over and over again that makes you feel good and that you know how to do is any good for you. You know, so if you're, let's say when we were working on Satin Doll a few weeks ago, you know, and I gave that podcast on that, and you, I said that's a good head for musicians to play. Let's say you're able to nail the A sections, but you're struggling with the bit, bridge. Well, what do you do? You work out, you isolate the bridge, and you work it out. You might even isolate it further and play the first four bars of the bridge and work that out, and then the second four bars. Sounds obvious. It's so obvious that people will skip over the notion. It sounds too easy. And why? It's hard to work on stuff you're struggling with. It feels good to play stuff you sound good on. I'm repeating myself, but you've got to hear this. Look at everything that you're responsible for. You know, if you're in high school and you play in the orchestra and the JE, you know, what pieces, you know, put them out, line it up. If you're just playing, just starting off, and you're playing by yourself and you're just learning the instruments and you're taking you're learning the instrument and you're taking lessons that's the stuff you're responsible for that's the stuff that should be on your priority you know best advice and if you've got a way, better way do that but list them out from weakest to strongest you know let's say you can walk over an F blues at 120 but 160 gives you problems you know what to do you take it down to 140 you take it up to 140 
and you work your way into 160. Now, I'm going to leave you with one thing, and this is related to practice, and that that's that you can get a lot done in a little time. Dan Hurley, who was one of the first uh, jazz theorists, and I studied with him for a short time at North Texas, said that the 10-minute breaks that he had between classes and students made, meant so much to him when he practiced because you could take one idea. Let's just take that idea of the bridge, the satin doll. What if you just focused on that if you just had 10 minutes, 10 minutes a day? Imagine what would happen. A lot, that, a lot can be done in these small sections. Now, like I said earlier, I'll be talking about practicing in subsequent episodes and practicing more slowly and practicing the stuff that, you know, doesn't feel so good and uh, getting the mindset for practicing, you know, and also logging your practicing. You know, there's apps out there. That's fine, but you can use just a notebook. But give some thought about how you're practicing your instrument and if you're getting results that you want, if you're doing these things that you need to do to become a better bass player. I'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.